Are you looking to improve your gut health or maybe get through perimenopause or menopause with more ease? Well, today on the podcast, I'm going to have Dr. Phil Rawls, and we're going to be talking about gut health, stress, and perimenopause. And he is an expert in herbal medicine. So he's going to be talking about different herbal support and ways that you can support your body to improve your gut health and to decrease the stress in your body and decrease some of those symptoms from perimenopause and menopause. And friends, I encourage you as you're listening to this episode, if you could use some extra support along your health journey, I encourage you to reach out and set up a free health coaching call. I would love to support you along the way and get you connected with the resources that you need to not be stuck any longer. Check the description down below for those links and ways that you can work with me. Hi friends, and welcome to the Healthy Beyond 40 show. I'm Michelle, mom of four and military wife, and I'm passionate about helping women get healthy from the inside out so they can feel better and live their best life. Do you feel like you're struggling to lose weight and get in shape? If you're ready to develop healthier habits, exercise consistently, and lose weight sustainably, then you're in the right place. I combine my expertise from my doctorate in physical therapy to my experience as a health coach, personal trainer, and yoga teacher to bring you actionable steps for a healthy lifestyle. No magic pill here, so lace up those shoes and get moving. Welcome to the podcast today. I have Dr. Bill Rawls on the podcast, and he's going to be sharing with us all about gut health, herbal supplements, and really how we can continue to take a holistic approach to ourselves. So welcome to the podcast today. Feel free to introduce yourself and share us a little bit about you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I'm Dr. Bill Rawls. I've been a physician for about 30 years. My training was in obstetrics and gynecology. I did that for about 20 years, but doing OB call is really rigorous. I was in the hospital every second to third night, most of the night and most weekends, and By my late 40s, that caught up with me. I started having health issues, defined it as fibromyalgia first, later defined it as chronic Lyme disease, and found that conventional medical treatments really did not help me. Long story short, did herbal therapy, got my life back, resorted my whole life and career. And I've been helping people with those kinds of chronic illnesses for the past 15 or 20 years, but I often see things very differently than most conventional physicians. Yeah, I love that. And so he is a conventionally trained MD doctor, but also as your life changed and you were sick, you took this different approach and started looking into herbal medicine. So Mm -hmm. I love that. So tell us about the importance of gut health, especially when it comes to women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. Well, (laughs) gut health is how you feed your cells, you know? I mean, our body is made of cells, and all of our cells need the right nutrients. And, of course, some cells need different nutrients than others. You know, your thyroid needs iodine. Uh, Your heart cells run mostly off of fat. Your brain cells like a little bit of glucose for some fast energy. So all of our cells need different nutrients, But eating the right foods and processing them so you're absorbing the right nutrients and through the intestinal system is really critical to your health. And that can be a complex process, of course. Yeah. And so how do you see this showing up for people when they start to have problems with their gut health? You know, people have a range of symptoms, of course, anything from reflux to indigestion to sometimes painful ulcers to what we define as SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, you know, and it goes on from there. Yeah. And especially when women are going through that perimenopause or in menopause, is there anything when it comes to gut health that you really like to look at or different factors that come into play during that time? Yeah. You know, no matter what the health condition or illness, I like to boil it down to the underlying driving forces. And when you look at gut health and some of those kind of everyday conditions that I just mentioned, 
the driving force is primarily stress more than anything else. And it's not necessarily mental stress. It can be stress of menopause. It can be stress of chronic illness. You know, 75% of the people or more that I see with chronic illness have some kind of gut dysfunction. So stress is an underlying factor. And then second to that is eating the wrong foods. The two really can be a bad combination. So what stress does is it slows motility. And when you slow the intestinal tract down, everything gets backed up. So you get reflux and things sit in your stomach and you get ulcers. And bacteria grow as long as food is present. So we have bacteria through our entire tract, including the small bowel. So when that motility is slowed, bacteria keep feeding. And when they feed, they ferment and produce gas. So that's where the sm that trap gas and bloating comes from. So menopause is a stress. And so it's driving those factors. Now, then on top of that, if you're eating a high processed food, carbohydrate diet, and just doing all the wrong things from a dietary point of view, that can be a really bad combination that drives all of these things. So it's not just food. Everybody thinks it's what I'm eating. But I've had plenty of people that are eating all the right foods who are stressed, but they have slow motility. So they have reflux. They have stomach issues. They have SIBO. They have IBS, all of the above. I love that. And I like how you put stress first. Because I think so often stress can be vague. Sometimes we don't even recognize its impact on us. And so we're not looking at that. We want to look at, oh, it's easier to fix. Like this little thing I'm eating, stress can be a little more harder to fix. But just how important that is to be able to tune into that and recognize how that stress is playing out in your life. Yeah, exactly. And so I know you also recommend a 12-hour fast overnight, and I've talked about this just a little bit on the podcast. Can you explain more about why that 12-hour overnight fast is important? Yeah, I think it's really important for people to do what is comfortable for them and what feels natural. It's like some people, they eat one meal a day, and that's it, and they're happy with that. Other people, that doesn't work for it. It doesn't really work for me. You know, I like a light breakfast. I try to eat most of my food in the middle of the day and then kind of wind it up by, by early evening. But that, that time to stop eating, that window of 12 hours to 16 hours, depending on, you know, those personal preferences, that's time for the body to rest, for the GI tract to rest and for those cells to recover. I mean, you think about it, all of the cells in your body are like little microscopic machines, and they're working hard most of the day. Now, some of our cells, like our heart cells, have to rest in between beats, but the majority of our cells, they need some time to kind of rest and catch up. So if we're working them hard by not sleeping, by not resting, by eating these really irregular hours for us, keeping our stress levels up... They don't get that downtime that they need to recover and recuperate. So, so on one level, giving that 12-hour fast is time for the GI tract just to take a break and finish processing everything before you start over and start processing again the next day. But it also optimizes cellular autophagy. So autophagy is a process by which cells repair themselves and restore themselves. And so we know that 12 to 16 hours of fasting really helps promote autophagy to cells throughout the body. So it's really valuable from that respect. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I mean... From a practical standpoint, if you stop eating by eight, you can eat at eight in the morning again. It's not that long. A lot of kids, they need a good amount of sleep at night and they can do this too because their body needs to also recover. Yep. And so from a herbal standpoint, what do you recommend herbal supplement wise to help support gut health? I think as far as gut health, a lot of it is 
addressing those stress factors, but also the right foods that you're eating, you know, eating a whole food diet, eating plenty of vegetables. Yeah, th those things are important as far as, as, as normal gut function. The herbs are just supporting that. So I look at it from two ways. You have herbs that are helping us neutralize stress or become more stress tolerant, mm -hmm. our adaptogens. So some for the gut would be like ashwagandha, or if you're stressed, possibly calming herbs like passion flower and lemon balm and chamomile. Those things can be very calming to our overall well-being, but they also are calming the gut function and allow that gut function to re return and restore. So I think from that aspect, looking at the stress component, herbs can be really valuable. Adaptogens, ashwagandha, top of the list, but also herbs that help us in other ways by just soothing the gut all the way around. So there are a lot of choices out there. If you have really bad gut dysfunction and your gut is irritated, Slippery Elm provides something called mucilage, which helps protect the gut lining, protect those cells so they can, they can heal. Really important. Other kinds of things, chlorella, the freshwater algae is really nice for helping to soothe and promote healing in the gut. And then you have other herbs that calm overactivity like peppermint oil, cardamom, many of those kinds of herbs. Herbs that normalize bacterial overgrowth, berberine and berberine containing herbs like coptis can be really valuable. And, and for that, herbs in general, so many of the herbs that we use for chronic illness, chronic Lyme disease, like andrographis and, and garlic or ginger, wow, they're excellent for calming the gut. Ginger tea, you know, that's something that I do routinely just because it tastes good, but wow, does it have a really nice effect, anti-inflammatory effect on the mm -hmm. stomach and the gut. Yeah. And so when you're thinking about this, the one that first thing we wanted to work on with stress is using herbs to help calm the stress in our body. Yep. And then we're thinking about if my gut is irritated, what herbs can help with that? And then also what herbs can help if I'm having bacterial overgrowth. So thinking about these different things. And we didn't mention it yet, but you wrote the book, The Cellular Wellness Solution that I have too. And this book is laid out really nicely because you can turn to the chapter on gut health and learn more about these herbs too. So I'll share that link in the description for you guys. Okay. So I think that's really helpful because first it goes back to, we need to calm stress in the body and we can use cognitive strategies, journaling, other things like that. And then we use some herbs to help support that too. And also having that base of making sure that we're eating whole food, healthy food, working with that first. And then we add the supplements in. You know, natural behavior. I mean, taking several walks a day is really good for your gut because that calms you and it's just a natural process that, that helps that gut function work during the day. Yeah. And I love that you're bringing all these up because it's important to have that strong foundation of healthy lifestyles and then adding the extra support on top where you need it to. And so... Dr. Rawls, what would you say about herbal supplement when it comes for people to feel more comfortable during the perimenopause and menopause transition? There, there's some really nice herbs for that also. And, you know, what we're looking at with perimenopause is the loss of cells in the, the ovaries to produce estrogen. So it's a natural part of life. It happens. And Gradually, what's happening is we're losing, along with fertility, we're losing the ability to produce estrogen. So when that is starting to wane and estrogen starts fluctuating, then we have a lot of different kinds of symptoms. You have to think about what hormones do in the body is connect cells, all right? So our entire body is made of cells. And every cell in the body has to be in communication with every other cell in the body all the time. So every cell in the body has estrogen receptors. 
A lot of people don't know that. So when our ovaries are working in a normal fashion and you're getting those, that cyclic change in estrogen and progesterone and other hormones, then you're, the rest of the cells of your body are aware of that. When that starts to fluctuate and those levels are erratically going up and down, it sends an erratic message to all the other cells in the body. It also sends an erratic message to the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is a small, about walnut size part of the brainstem that is basically our thermostat. It can tra- controls sleep and wake and temperature and hunger and all of these things. And it works through the pituitary, which regulates through the thyroid metabolism, through the adrenals, our stress and circadian rhythms, and through the ovaries, our reproductive functions. So when that estrogen starts to falter and starts to become irregular, the hypothalamus is getting bad feedback and that affects everything in the whole chain. So it's affecting metabolism, it's affecting hunger, it's affecting sleep, it's affecting our ability to tolerate stress. So that whole wiring gets disrupted. So when we look at an herb, the benefit that we would want is calming that down. And so many of our herbs are adaptogens, again, that we mentioned, ashwagandha being at the top of the list, have the effect of balancing those hormones, that feedback that's coming to the hypothalamus, so the hypothalamus can do a better job of regulating everything else, and that symptom starts to become relieved. So ashwagandha is kind of the top of my list, one of my favorite herbs for regulating those kinds of symptoms. As far as irregular cycles that come with it, there is another herb called Vitex, and Vitex is really exceptionally good. The common name is Chastri Berry. Um, It's exceptionally good for regulating periods, so the two together can be really wonderful. I often add calming herbs of various kinds with the with the ashwagandha. And uh, one of my favorite things is L-theanine, a substance, it's an amino acid that you find in green tea that has this effect of competing with our exciting neurotransmitters in our brain. So it's calming us without sedating us. So it, it helps us fo- focus our brain. Ashwagandha can help focus mental functions so you put all those things together and it can be a really nice effect. And But even on top of that, some people may need some kind of hormone help along the way. So bioidentical hormones can help in addition. But if you're using the herbs, your requirements for estrogen replacement will be lessened. Mm, I like that. Yeah, so thinking about how can we start with our lifestyle strategies, of food, exercise, nutrition, and stress relief, then adding in these herbs, how can we use those herbs to help bring more calming and less stress into our body, then adding the bioidentical hormones if someone still needs it too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to look at it and look at the different step-by-step approach. And also, you know, when someone is transitioning from perimenopause to menopause, the progesterone is slowly going down over time too, which is a natural calming hormone. So a lot of what you're talking about is how can we continue to sort of bring more calm and less stress in our body? Because I think a lot of women have tend to put themselves on the back burner and they really haven't taken care of themselves. So I think it can also be an opportunity of how can I take care of my body better? Yeah. You know, if your body is stressed, then all of that is going to be more difficult. And um, so, yeah, doing all the things that you need to do as far as diet and lifestyle, they're so important. But herbs on top of that can make a huge difference in someone's life, especially, you know, if they're in that stages of trying to make those changes, which can sometimes be challenging. I mean, life just gets in the way so often. Yeah. And what we're talking about herbal supplements, is there much of a risk of taking an herbal supplement? Yeah, it depends on the herb like everything else. <laughs> so, you know, when we talk about herbs, we're talking about plants. 
And of course, not all plants are safe for us. You know, nobody would make the mistake of eating poison ivy for health benefits, right? So when you look at plants, things that we can use span all the way from food, which is basically nutritional, to plants with strong drug-like or poisonous properties that we would probably want to stay away from. And kind of in the middle are adaptogens and so many herbs that work by balancing hormones, protecting the cells of our body from stress, like free radicals and toxic substances and microbes. So instead of having this drug-like effect, like so many drugs or some herbs that, that are kind of in that outer portion, these things are just protecting us and reducing internal stress in our body. And when that stress is reduced, our body functions better, our, our cells function better. So adaptogens, of which there are many, ashwagandha, I mentioned, rhodiola, reishi, cordyceps, there are just so many great adaptogens out there, but also herbs that don't, that are just mainly protective, like turmeric is a wonderful anti-inflammatory, and, and go to cola, which is an herb that from India that helps protect the brain, and bacopa. So there's so many herbs that can really help. Hawthorne is excellent for you know protecting our cardiovascular functions. So all of these herbs really are next to food as far as their safety level. Not to say somebody couldn't have an allergic reaction to a certain herb, just like they could have an allergic reaction to a food. But most people are going to tolerate these herbs very well, and the potential for the harm is pretty darn low. Yeah. So I think when you're starting with these herbs and these gentler herbs, the risk is not not that much. You should become educated about what you're doing and make sure it doesn't conflict with anything if you're taking medication, but they're a lot more gentler and safer. Just like you said, they're sort of a step up from food. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Perfect. Is there anything else that you would like to share today? Any other tip? There are lots of great things out there. You know, it's um, it, it, it all boils down to cellular health. Our body is made of cells. That's why I wrote this book. And, you know, we look at the body as being really complicated, as made of systems and processes and all of that. But all the processes going on in the body are done by cells. I mean, absolutely everything that happens in your body, whether it's thyroid hormone being produced or your heart beating or brain impulses firing, it's all cells. And every cell in your body needs five basic things. It needs the right nutrients. It needs a clean environment free of toxins. It needs downtime to recover. And generally that's like eight hours of sleep at night. It needs good blood flow from being from physical activity to flush away toxic substances. And it needs protection from microbes, which are our cell's arch enemy, because they're things that are flowing in our system that we're not even aware of all the time. Viruses, bacteria, everything else. So that's basically the formula for wellness right there. So if you're eating a healthy diet, taking steps to clean your water and your air and keep your food clean. You're getting eight hours of sleep at night and you are at least walking three miles a day. You know, that's kind of my minimum. And taking herbs. Now, what the big thing that herbs do is they they protect our cells from from threatening microbes. That's a huge part of what herbs do. So if you're doing those five things, the chances of you being healthy is extremely high. And that's wellness in a nutshell right there. Yeah, I love that. And tell us, I know you also have vital plans where people, you make your own herbs and sort of a combination of herbs together for specific things. So tell us more about vital plans and where people can find you. Sure. Yeah, it's vitalplan.com. And the, this is a place for people to find herbal support for a range of different conditions from, you know, things like fibromyalgia and chronic Lyme disease all the way to just general health. 
So it's uh, combinations of supplements that I have found over years working with people just do all the things that I want. And they're built around that formula of cellular health just to build out, you know, what people need on an everyday basis to stay healthy or recover lost health in, in different situations. Yeah, perfect. And I'll have the links down below to that and to his book. And just thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing oh, my pleasure. your information. Yeah, my pleasure.